Hey guys, it's Will, and oh, I'm here with the Blu-ray review, but guess what? It's not a Hong Kong movie! What the hell? I know, look, these are all Hong Kong movies. All I do is Hong Kong movies. What could I possibly be here to talk to you about today? Well, guess what? It's an 80s movie. It's not just an 80s movie. It's an 80s action movie. It's not just an 80s action movie. It's a badass, grindhousey, kick you in the face 80s action movie. And it's not just that. It's a canon movie. It's a Sam Furstenberg movie. It's a Michael Dudikoff movie. And it's not American Ninja. What? Oh, hell yes. Avenging Force. So if you don't know this, if you watch the 80s Nerdgasm channel, that's run by my very good friend Mike. And um, Mike and I review like a lot of 80s movies and kind of like stuff into the earlier 90s too that's very heavily influenced by 80s movies. And I am a huge fan of like 80s medium to low budget like B action movies. I just like I love those movies. Um, and so when I saw the 88 films, so if you're unfamiliar, like I do a lot of, uh, you know, like reviews of the 88 films, um, like Jackie Chan releases and other Hong Kong, like Shaw Brothers films and stuff like that. Right. But 88 films has like a, like a long history of doing like they do 80s movies. They put out American Ninja and stuff like that. They do slasher films. They do Italian films like they're they're very diverse and very like company that has like a pretty awesome, pretty broad scope. And so when I were put when I saw they were putting this out, I was like, I have to get my hands on that movie because I have not seen this movie since it was on VHS. So. I mean, I was probably a kid at that point. I was probably too young to have seen the movie, to be perfectly honest with you. And it definitely didn't sink in what this movie's about, because watching it again, I was like, what the... So, um, let me just show you the... Uh, I'm going to show out the physical packaging for you here. Um, and here's the back of the... It has the slip case, right? And which is the classic, like, 88 film slip case. And then we have... There's reversible cover art. And I just thought this was really cool. So, I reversed it. Um, and... Uh, Here's the um, the disc, and then the, as you can see, the um, the cover art that you like the the one that it comes with that you can reverse is the same as the slip cover. But I thought since I already had that on the slip cover, um, and since this is just super cool, this almost reminds me of like those Thai movie posters that are like hand painted and like a little bit like um, kind of feel like handmade. You know what I mean? Like I really like that style of artwork. And then it also comes. This is super cool with, and I believe as is usually the case with eighty eight films, this is like the first three thousand that have like all the bells and whistles with it. Um, it's got these postcards. So there you go, there's Mike. Duty, as he calls himself in his interview on here. I didn't know that was one of his nicknames. Uh, oh man, hell yeah. Yes, that's so that's this, you know, this is Steve James and, and Michael Dudikoff and they were in um, American Ninja together and uh, this film was actually shot. <laughs> oh my God, that's amazing that it shot. Hell yeah. Um, this movie was shot right after American Ninja. They were basically like shot back to back. So um, Sam Furstenberg actually talks on, he got, he has an interview on the um, Blu-ray. He talks about how Michael Dudikoff and um, Sam, uh, Steve James were like really, really tight coming into this movie and their chemistry was like incredible because they had just spent months together in the Philippines shooting American Ninja, which I didn't know was shot in the Philippines actually. So I learned stuff about American Ninja from watching this. So I'm gonna talk about the presentation of the film real quick and then I'm gonna run through some of the cool stuff on the bonus features. So um, it's HD, obviously it's 1080, and um, it looks really good. And then like for one of those films that you're, I know I say this a lot, but like for those types of films you're accustomed to seeing on VHS, it's really just kind of incredible to see them on these Blu-ray presentations. Um, the one thing that's very interesting about this, uh, the Blu-ray presentation here, is that it you can tell that this movie is like a grindhousey type of movie in that there are like there will be occasional and it's very very occasional so don't let this put you off from getting this edition because it's really incredible but there are occasional moments where like there's a fight scene in the beginning and the you know the there's an established shot that's like very clear very crisp like looks great in hd and then there's a reverse shot that's like it, it doesn't quite look as good as like a little scratchy or blurry or out of focus or um and it's obvious that that the film print the best film print that they were able to find that they were pulling these materials from was just not perfectly preserved and is not in perfect condition and you see that with a lot of those older hong kong movies too is that these films because they weren't terribly expensive and and people 
didn't put a ton of care into their preservation. Like there are moments in the film where like in, in the Fearless Hyena release, which is right here from 88 films, there's like, there's a couple shots that are a little bit out of focus, but like all the, all the shots around them are like amazing HD, perfectly crisp, like 2K remaster shots. And it's obvious that that was just like the best that they could do with the material that they had. Um, and that's really interesting for me too, because it adds flavor to it. Cause you feel like it's like, it's like seeing it in a theater almost on like a film print, right? Like you get that, feeling of what the movie is and where it comes from and stuff like that so um so to talk to you a little bit and to tell you about the movie you're unfamiliar with this movie it's really incredible to revisit in 2020 because it's so timely it's kind of surreal because it came out in 1986 or 87 i wrote it down 1986 so the movie is about this group of white supremacists who live in the south they live in like the bayou basically or like new orleans and they do like a most dangerous game kind of thing where they take people out into the swamp and they hunt them they're called Pentangle. There's five leaders of the group, right? And it's five people who are very smart and very successful. Like one's a senator and one's a really successful businessman and stuff like that. One's like an athlete, right? And they're very like publicly respected people. And they lead this horde of basically ignorant, really angry, um, like white supremacists, basically. They, they like recruit them. They manipulate them. They send them out to do their dirty work. And, um there's like a speech that's done in this old kind of like ballroom that's like this really beautiful old location um where this guy talks about like you know immigration and all this kind of like racist propaganda and dogma that is exactly the kind of stuff that we've become accustomed to hearing in 2020 it's just it's it's sad that this movie is 34 years old and it's it's still so relevant but it's also surreal and kind of odd, honestly, that they it, it hits the nail so hard on the head for 2020. And this movie is really aggressively anti-racist, which is kind of incredible because, you know, with you, you can't point to too many action movies where they have a lot riding on, like, we're going to put money into this movie. Like Sam Furstenberg says on the commentary on this movie, you know, he's the director, that even though it was kind of a low-budget movie, it had a high budget for a low budget, right? So, like, Canon really believed in this movie, and, and to, to make a movie that's so aggressively anti-racist when, like, so many companies are so afraid of having any kind of messaging in their film, right? Um, it's kind of amazing. And it's, it's really awesome to watch this movie. And I will say that there are moments of this movie that are really uncomfortable because of what it's about. But, um, you know, I mean, it, it is ultimately, at the end of the day, a canon movie. So you, you'll, you'll know what you're expecting if you're familiar with canon's films, right? So to talk a little bit about the bonus features, um, they're really good. There's not too many on here, so it's not like that feeling of being overwhelmed by like, oh my god, there's 30 hours of stuff I have to watch. But um, I'm just going to read it to you off the back here, and then I'll talk about it. The different things in here so there's the collectible postcards there's an introduction by director sam furstenberg there's the original trailer audio commentary with sam furstenberg and michael dudikoff um and then an interview with michael dudikoff and then um uh there's the reversible sleep so the interview with michael dudikoff is really really cool and like pretty in depth like he talks about his whole career which i didn't know that much about his career and how he was like discovered by um like an agent who handled models and he's like do you have any interest in doing like any modeling and then from there he started he got a job on happy days actually and the head of paramount studios saw him on a live taping of happy days and was like hey that guy's pretty funny like we should sign him to a contract and he did a bunch of comedy and then his agent told him about american ninja and he's like yeah sure why not he seems like he's very chill and very like nice and easy to get along with and very like he lives in the moment and he said that like a lot of people when he when he went to do american ninja a lot of people were like oh you can't change from comedy to action or like this is going to so affect your career and he like didn't he said he didn't really think about that at all he was just kind of like i want to do this movie and then he got along really well with sam Furstenberg. he's like i want to do more movies with this guy and like i like working with canon and it just kind of like went from there he just went from project to project doing what was interesting to him living in the moment um and, you know, he talks about his friendship with Steve James, how they were really close. He also says that Steve James is really funny because he worked a lot on his body. Obviously, if you've seen him in any of his movies, he's, like, very muscular and he's very fit. And he would take his shirt off as often as possible. And, like, sometimes Dudikoff would be like, hey, um, you know, this is not going to match the other shots because you're, like, you don't have your shirt off in the other shots. And he's like, I don't care. I'm showing off his muscles, <laughs> um, which is awesome. Uh, so, so yeah, that's, like, a, it's a really good interview. Um, the Sam Furstenberg introduction is really cool, too. I didn't know that he's not American, so because I I read interviews with him, but I've never heard him talk before. He's Israeli, which makes sense, right? Because um, uh, Menahem Golan and Yoram Globus, who ran 
canon were Israeli. So, um, but he seems like, like the nicest dude in the world and he's totally unpretentious. And he like, in his intro, he thanks like every single member of the crew and is like, Oh, if it weren't for the editor or we couldn't have done this. If it weren't for like the amazing music we had from the composer, the movie wouldn't have been as good. Like he basically says that he, he says that he thinks this is his best film. And then he says that every other person involved is the reason it's his best film, not him. He's like, it's Michael Dudikoff's best performance. Steve James is incredible. Um, I wrote down the name of the guy who wrote the script, James Booth. He's an English actor who's also in the film. He's like, James Booth wrote this incredible script. Like, all I have to do is basically show up and tell him where to point the camera. But, um, so that's his introduction. It's pretty cool. It's pretty short. And then the commentary is incredible because it's the, he, Sam Furstenberg and Michael Dudikoff seem to have really great memories. And, um, like, obviously they have good memories of being on the set. But what I mean is they both have a really good capacity for remembering things because they, tell so many amazing stories throughout this commentary like oh do you remember on this day we were shooting this and that happened and like Dudikoff talks about shooting in the swamp and how there were like water moccasins hanging off the trees and there were gators coming by and like um spiders everywhere and like at one point he fell asleep in the sun and he woke up and his skin was just like burning everywhere and he didn't know if he was like sunburned or he got bitten by ants or like what happened, but he had to go and shoot the scene with all these explosions right afterwards. And Sam Furstenberg was like, there's going to be an explosion there, an explosion there. And he's like, can't even remember like what, where he's supposed to be running. And like, um, so it's just really cool. Like to hear them tell all their stories about being on the set of this film. And like, uh, BJ Davis is the stunt coordinator and he's in the movie a lot. And it's really funny. Cause it's like in the, if you've seen the opening scene, they actually talk about how the opening scene was shot by the second unit while they were off doing other stuff. And in the opening scene, B.J. Davis is one of the characters who's fighting, and he was a stunt coordinator. And then later on, there's a scene where, like, someone is shot, uh, like, coming on a motorcycle, and someone is shot on a horse, and they're, like, flipping off. Both of those are B.J. Davis, so he plays multiple characters in the same scene. Um, and a lot of the crew members are in the movie in, like, small parts, um, which is kind of cool. Because they're like, oh, remember that guy? He was, like, the electrician or, like, the prop master or whatever, stuff like that. Um, they talk about the locations and where they shot and how they shot it and, like... Um, you know, like stuff like there, like the big house that the um, that one of the characters lives in, one of the bad guys. He has this, like this big beautiful house. Sam Furstenberg is like, oh, that that house was actually for sale, and so we were able to rent it from the people who had it for sale. So we, it was like all that stuff was like in there, and it was like we didn't do it, like it was really cool to like go in and shoot in this old house in New Orleans and stuff like that. They talk about the hotel they stayed in, like the things they would do day to day with each other, like hanging out and stuff like that. It's just a really fun. Like they obviously are really good friends. And they have a lot of respect for each other. And they it's just really fun to listen to them talk about filmmaking and how much joy they get from it. And, and also their experiences on making this film. Like, what's a set? What's a location? I'm just looking at my notes to see if there's anything else that I kind of left out here. But, um, oh, here's one other cool little detail. And then I'll, I'll kind of wrap this up. But there's a car. There's a really cool pickup truck in this movie, if you're familiar, that I think is um, Michael Dudikoff's character's truck. And they talk about how the truck was was modified because of some stunts they had to do with it. And they just left it like that for the whole shoot. So if you look at it and you know that, then you can see that and be like, oh, yeah, yeah, that wouldn't, a car wouldn't normally look that like that, right? But they also talk about how that was actually a model that was coming out that had not yet been, like, released yet by the car company. And it was given to them for the movie as, like, a promo thing. And the car company was like, please don't mess it up that much. And if you've seen the movie, you know what happens to that car. Like, there's a whole chase that's, like, jumping off and stuff and everything. And they were kind of like, oh, I don't know uh so anyway yeah avenging force it's the 88 films release i highly recommend it if you like canon films if you like 80s action if you like b movies if you like ninja movies can't like i said canon like grindhouse like that kind of stuff it's an awesome movie this is a great release um it's region b i should point that out too so that means that if you have a region b blu-ray player it'll play no problems otherwise you would need a multi-region or a um like a region free player a lot of people ask me for recommendations on multi-region players i got mine from a shop in los angeles that is called foreign exchange blu-ray he's got a website uh, which i can link to in the description of the video but he gets his multi-region players from a, a company in chicago called 220 electronics which is the company that makes them um, and they have different models. They have Sony's. They have um, the one I have is uh, a um, an LG. So anyway, I'll just put that information in the description below. My name is Will. I'm talking about Avenging Force. Uh, thanks so much for checking in with us. It's a great Blu-ray. Go check it out. We'll see you next time.